Part 2. Learning. How we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. Annie Dillard. 7. The Ingredients of Impossible. If you're hunting high achievement, motivation is what gets you into the game, but learning is what keeps you there. Whether your interest is capital I impossible, doing what's never been done, or small i impossible, doing what you've never done, both paths demand that you develop actual expertise. In his classic book on decision-making, Sources of Power, psychologist Gary Klein makes exactly this point, identifying eight types of knowledge that are visible to experts, yet invisible to everyone else. Patterns that novices don't notice. Anomalies, or events that didn't happen, or events that violate expectations. The big picture. The way things work. Opportunities and improvisations. Events that already happened, the past, or will happen, the future. Differences that are too small for novices to detect. Their own limitations. Without all the knowledge on Klein's list, the impossible remains impossible, because the items on Klein's list are literally the ingredients of impossible. They are the requisite knowledge base, but developing this base requires learning, a ton of learning. Lifelong learning is the technical term for this ton. Lifelong learning keeps the brain sharp, both preventing cognitive decline and training up memory. It also boosts confidence, communication skills, and career opportunities. These improvements are the reasons psychologists consider lifelong learning foundational to satisfaction and well-being. But for those interested in peak performance, there's also flow to consider. If our goal is to stay in the challenge skills sweet spot, to maximize the time we spend in the zone, then we need to be constantly stretching ourselves to the edge of our abilities. This means we are constantly learning and improving, and as a result, constantly increasing the size of the next challenge. But to meet these greater challenges, we have to acquire even more skills and more knowledge. Lifelong learning is how we can keep pace with the moving target that is the challenge skills sweet spot. It's the bedrock foundation of a high-flow lifestyle. Yet, here's where things get tricky. Learning is an invisible skill. For the most part, you're bad until you're better. Sure, you can make a conscious choice to dig into a particular information stream and have the grit to put in the necessary legwork. But the bulk of the process takes place out of sight. The major neurological mechanisms of learning pattern recognition, memory consolidation, network construction, are, by design, beyond our ken. And this raises an important question. How do you improve what you cannot see? 8. Growth Mindsets and Truth Filters Pretty much anything you want to learn comes with basic requirements. No matter how big the desire, if you don't own poles, boots, and bindings, then figuring out how to ski is a non-starter. The same is true for the act of learning itself. If you're interested in amplifying and accelerating this process, then you need to start with the right equipment, a growth mindset, and a truth filter. Let's take them one at a time. The first of these, the growth mindset, has already been covered. I'm bringing it up again as a reminder. Without a growth mindset, learning is all but impossible. Having a fixed mindset alters our underlying neurobiology, making the acquisition of new information exceptionally difficult. So before we can begin learning, we need to believe that learning is possible. What's more, a growth mindset saves you time. It means your brain is ready to absorb new knowledge, so you don't waste hours spinning wheels. 
It's also a critical way to limit negative self-talk, which, because it impacts our ability to find connections between ideas, is another barrier to learning. More crucial, a growth mindset helps you see mistakes as opportunities for improvement rather than condemnations of character, ensuring you'll get farther faster and with much less emotional turmoil along the way. While the right mindset prepares the brain for learning, the right truth filter helps us to assess and evaluate what is being learned. Nearly every peak performer I've met has developed some kind of truth filter. A great many have discovered theirs the hard way, through trial and error. My suggestion? Shortcut the process. Consistent peak performance requires constant learning. So the best way to improve this portion of the process? Learn to learn faster. Learn the meta skills that surround the learning process and use them to amplify the invisible. And having a system in place for fast and accurate information evaluation does just that. My own truth filter was definitely developed the hard way. My background is journalism, which, alongside science and engineering, is one of the industries where a truth filter is how business gets done. In science and engineering, the scientific method serves this function. Newspapers and magazines, meanwhile, rely on a different metric for determining if a bit of information is true and can be published. If someone tells you something and you can get three other experts to confirm their statement, it's a fact. You can publish without peril. But not so fast. In the early 2000s, a major magazine hired me to do a story about the neuroscience of mystical experiences. One of the first things I discovered was that scientists had made some serious progress in this arena. Experiences that were once seen as mystical were starting to become known as biological, and this seemed like big news. I wanted to know why more people didn't know about this progress. I asked my main subject this question. The problem, he said, was that two other researchers, not respectable scientists, more like spiritual charlatans, in his opinion, had written best-selling books on the topic. These books had obscured the hard science with mystical speculation, and that was the end of the line. Scientific curiosity went in less metaphysical directions, and research funding dried up. As a reporter receiving this information, I did what I was supposed to do. I asked three other experts. All three confirmed. They all gave me the same two names for the same two researchers who had written those same two best-selling books. Done deal. The article went to press. Afterward, my editor got an angry telephone call from one of the researchers whose name I'd named. Turns out, this man was a thoroughly respected, extremely well-published, Ph.D.-level neuropsychologist whose book on the science of mystical experiences was a. Not a bestseller, B. Not spiritual at all, and C. Not even a book. It was a collection of peer-reviewed journal articles by a lot of different researchers. And he was right. Sure, I had an excuse. Four people had given me the exact same wrong fact, like, what are the odds? But the fault was mine. I didn't do the extra legwork and instead had slandered a good scientist. My truth filter, even though it was an industry standard, wasn't good enough. This is when I decided, if publication standards demand triplicate fact confirmation, I would always go for quintuplicate proof. I would always fact-check my facts with five experts. And that's when I discovered something strange. Ask four people a question, and you'll likely get very similar answers. Sometimes this happens because you get the name of the next person to talk to from the last. Sometimes it happens because fields have dominant trends. But if you take the time to ask a fifth person, chances are they'll tell you something that conflicts with just about everything you've learned so far, which in turn usually requires another five discussions with five more experts to sort out. So that's my truth filter. Five experts per question. 
and if those five disagree, then talk to five more. In bold, to offer a different example, I described Elon Musk's first principle thinking, or what might be called a reductionist truth filter. The idea originates with Aristotle, who described first principles as the first basis from which a thing is known, but it's easier to explain via example. When Musk was considering entering into the solar energy business, he knew one of the biggest bottlenecks was intermittent power and the resulting storage problem. Since the sun doesn't shine after dark, intermittent power, we need to be able to save energy gathered during the day in batteries for deployment at night, storage. Yet instead of basing his solar go or no go decision on what the market was doing or what his competitors were offering, Musk got online and visited the London Metal Exchange. What did he look up? The base price of nickel, cadmium, lithium, and such. How much do the fundamental component parts of a battery actually cost? He knew that technology itself always improves. No matter how expensive it is right now, later it's always cheaper. So once Musk saw that these basic parts were selling for pennies on the dollar, he saw a ton of room for technological improvement. That's when Solar City was born. That's first principle thinking. It's a truth filter, a system for information assessment that allows us to make better choices faster. Musk used this same approach when founding SpaceX, his rocket company. At the time, he wasn't thinking of going into the space business. He was instead trying to figure out the cost of purchasing a rocket so he could run an experiment on the surface of Mars. After talking to a bunch of aerospace executives, he discovered the cost was sky high, up to $65 million. But as he told Wired magazine, So I said, Okay, let's look at first principles. What is a rocket made of? Aerospace-grade aluminum alloys, plus some titanium, copper, and carbon fiber. Then I asked, what is the value of those materials on the commodity market? It turned out that the materials cost of a rocket was about 2% of the typical price. Thus, SpaceX was born. And within a few years, building up from first principle thinking, Musk had managed to slash the cost of launching a rocket tenfold. First principle thinking the scientific method, my five expert rule, these are all truth filters. Feel free to borrow my rule or adopt Musk's approach or come up with your own. What really matters is that you create a rigorous truth filter and put it to use. You can't get to impossible on bad information. Plus, there are performance benefits to consider. Being able to trust the information you're working with lowers anxiety, doubt, and cognitive load, which are three things that loosen our focus, hamper our ability to get into flow, and block learning itself. But with the right mindset to approach new information and a rigorous truth filter with which to judge that information, you've laid the necessary foundation for amplifying the invisible. 9. The ROI on Reading a growth mindset puts the brain in the ready condition for learning. A truth filter gives you a way to evaluate what you've learned. And this raises the next question, the question of learning materials. From which source exactly should we try to learn? And this brings us to a hard truth. If you're interested in learning, then you're interested in books. Certainly, as an author, this might seem entirely self-serving. But hear me out. One of the most unsettling facts about my chosen profession in this digital age is how frequently people tell me they don't read books anymore. Sometimes they read magazine articles, often blogs. A book is too much of a commitment, is one comment, frequently heard. This isn't surprising. According to the National Endowment for the Arts, most adults spend an average of seven minutes a day reading for pleasure. A few years back, the Pew Research Center reported that nearly one-quarter of American adults 
hadn't read a single book in the past year. Yet, while it may not be surprising, it's devastating to anyone interested in mastering the art of learning. To explain why, let's start with the main response I hear. A book is too much of a commitment. Fair enough. But let's talk about what you're getting in return for that commitment. There's a value proposition at work here. You give an author your time in exchange for their ideas. So let's break down the exact nature of this trade. We'll start with blogs. The average adult reading speed is about 250 words per minute. The average blog post is about 800 words long. This means that most of us read the average blog post in three and a half minutes. So what do you get for those minutes? Well, in my case, about three days' worth of effort. For a typical blog, I usually spend about a day and a half researching a topic and an equal amount of time writing. The research mainly involves reading books and articles. I also talk to experts. If the topic is in my wheelhouse, usually one or two conversations suffice. Outside my wheelhouse kicks that up to three or four. The writing usually requires some more reading and an extra conversation or two and the hard work of putting words together in a straight line. That's the value exchange. Your three and a half minutes in exchange for me digesting 50 to 100 pages worth of material, then spending three to five hours talking about it, then spending another day and a half adding in my new ideas and restructuring the whole result into something to read. Now let's look at a long-form magazine article, the kind you would find in Wired or The Atlantic Monthly. These articles are usually about 5,000 words long, meaning it takes the average person 20 minutes to read. So again, what do you get in return for your 20 minutes? In my case, you get about a month of research before the actual reporting starts. Another six weeks spent reporting, figure 25 conversations with experts and far more reading, and another six weeks of writing and editing. So in return for you agreeing to give my words about 20 minutes of your time, you're getting access to about four months of my brain power, labor, whatever. I think if you look at it this way, you'll see the average magazine article makes for a fairly good trade. Your time as a reader quintuples, but my time as an author has increased 30-fold, and that's a fairly incredible bargain. But a book is an entirely different ballgame. Let's take The Rise of Superman, my book on flow and the science of ultimate human performance. The book is around 75,000 words long so it takes the average reader about five hours worth of effort. So what do you get for your five hours? In the case of Rise, about 15 years worth of my life. Look at these figures side by side. Blogs. Three minutes gets you three days. Articles. Twenty minutes gets you four months. Books. Five hours gets you 15 years. So, why is it better to read books than blogs? Condensed knowledge. If you go on a blog bender and spend five hours reading my blogs at three and a half minutes per blog, you'll manage to slog through about 86 of them. Thus, you're trading those five hours for 257 days' worth of my effort. Meanwhile, if you had spent those same five hours reading Rise, you would have gotten... 5,475 days. Books are the most radically condensed form of knowledge on the planet. Every hour you spend with Rise is actually about three years of my life. You just can't beat numbers like that. Certainly there are other information streams available. Maybe you're just not a reader. Maybe talks are your thing. Perhaps documentaries. Unfortunately, while talks and documentaries are great for igniting curiosity, neither approaches the information density of books. Put it this way. I give a handful of speeches a month, typically in the one-hour range. If I'm talking flow, that hour gets you the information contained in a couple of blogs, 20 pages of Rise, and another 20 from Stealing Fire. Maybe a few stories that didn't show up in the books added for spice. 
Altogether, it's 70 pages of text for an hour of your time. Seems like an okay trade. But here's the rub. You're missing the details. Again, take Rise. The listener gets 20 pages from the book, but only one, maybe two, details per page. But the book actually contains way more information. The reader's detail count is four to eight facts a page, plus a much longer time period to process that information. It's the medium dictating terms to the message. It's also basic neurobiology. Moreover, books pay performance dividends. Studies find that they improve long-term concentration, reduce stress, and stave off cognitive decline. Reading has also been shown to improve empathy, sleep, and intelligence. If you combine these benefits with the information density books provide, we start to see why everyone from tech titans like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and Elon Musk, to cultural icons like Oprah Winfrey, Mark Cuban, and Warren Buffett, credit their success to their incredible passion for books. Books were also the very first performance tip I ever learned, back when I was first learning about the impossible. It was taught to me by a wonderful magician named Joe Leffler, the proprietor of Pandora's Box, the magic shop that ate my childhood. Pandora's Box was a long, narrow shop of wonders. The right wall was all windows, the left wall, bright and shiny, a riot of magic contraptions, cards, coins, feathers, flowers, silks, swords, bird cages, top hats, mirrors of all shapes, and of course, rope. But the back wall, the first thing anyone saw when walking into the shop, stuffed with books, wall to wall and floor to ceiling. I was puzzled. Bobo's modern coin magic had a position of eye-catching prominence, but surely the bejeweled scimitar from sword through card was better for business. After all, as Joe was often pointing out, magic was a tough racket and he needed all the help he could get. I asked him about this one day, about why he didn't move the books to someplace less prominent and fill that eye-catching space with something that might sell. Joe shook his head, pointed at the back of the store and said, they stay where they are. Why? Books, he said with a smile. Books are where they keep the secrets. 10. Five not-so-easy steps for learning almost anything. A few years back, while downhill mountain biking in northern New Mexico, I was riding a chairlift and talking to a college student who asked an interesting question. When do I feel like I know enough about a subject to write about that subject for a major magazine or a newspaper? What the guy really wanted to know was a little more complicated and had term paper ramifications. But it got me thinking about what it took to be confident enough in what I'd learned before I was willing to have an opinion in public. What follows is my answer. It's a five not-so-easy step process for learning just about anything. And it's where we need to turn our attention to next. Up to now, our focus has been on establishing the ready conditions for learning. Here we dig into the process itself. More specifically, we're digging into the process I went through before I was willing to go public with an opinion about a topic. I developed it over my 30 years as a journalist, where becoming a semi-expert in a subject was a prerequisite for being able to write about that subject. Since I worked for over a hundred different publications in that time period, covering everything from hard science and high tech to sports, politics, and culture, I had to become very good at a lot of difficult topics in fairly short time frames. Also, as this was mostly back in the day when newspapers and magazines had budgets for fact-checkers and copy editors, the accuracy of my reporting was always put through an incredibly rigorous gauntlet, and getting things wrong was an easy way to get fired. Since I needed to eat, I needed to learn how to learn, anything and everything, accurately and quickly. Or, as my old editor at GQ, Jim Nelson, once explained, 
A million people a month read this publication, give or take, as we cover stories that fall outside of the purview of traditional news outlets. When we write about something, it's very often the only opinion about a subject any of our readers will ever see. That's a serious responsibility. It's why we try very, very hard to never get things wrong. Here's how I learned to get it right. Step 1. The Five Books of Stupid I think the actual number probably differs for everybody. But when I approach a new subject, my rule of thumb is to allow myself five books worth of stupid. That is, I pick five books on a subject and read them all without judging my learning along the way. This point is worth reiterating. Learning doesn't make us feel smart, at least not at first. At first, learning makes us feel stupid. New concepts and new terminology can often add up to new frustrations. But don't judge yourself for the stupidity you feel along the way. On the path to peak performance, quite often, your emotions don't mean what you think they mean. Consider the frustration that comes from being bad at something. The feeling is one of stalled progress and simmering anger. But it's actually a sign that you're moving in the right direction. In fact, that frustration level is increasing the presence in your system of norepinephrine, whose main function is to prime the brain for learning. You need to feel this frustration in order to produce this neurochemical. And you need this neurochemical in order for learning to actually take place. Rather than a sign that you're moving in the wrong direction, frustration is actually a cue that you're moving in the right direction. So, for these five books, your job is to keep turning pages and forgive yourself the confusion that will inevitably arise along the way. The main goal in reading these five books is to become familiar with terminology. We talked about this earlier, but it bears repeating as, truthfully, terminology can be much of the battle. Most of what makes learning difficult is specialized language, and it usually takes about five books to begin to get a real feel for this language. What this also means is that for the first three books, a lot of what you're reading you won't understand completely. Don't stop. Don't go back to the beginning of the book and start over. Don't bother to look up every word you don't know. The secret is to not get too frustrated and to just keep going. Biologically, a lot of learning comes down to pattern recognition, and most of that takes place on an unconscious level. As long as you keep reading, then you'll keep picking up tiny bits of information and your pattern recognition system will keep stitching these bits into bigger pieces. Those bigger pieces become your beachhead on the shores of new knowledge. And establish that beachhead in a very particular way. For starters, get out your notebook. Take a very specific kind of notes as you go. The goal is not to write down everything you think you need to know. There are only three main things to focus on. First, as mentioned earlier, take notes about the historical narrative. This gives the brain an easy way to order new information and amplifies learning rates. Second, as was also discussed, pay attention to terminology. If a technical word pops up three or four times, write it down, look it up, and every time you see the word again, read the definition. Keep this up until the meaning starts to lock into place. Third, most critically, always take notes on stuff that gets you excited. If you come across a quote that speaks to your soul, into the notebook it goes. If you come to a fact that makes your jaw drop, save it for later. If a question pops into your head, write it down. Stuff you find curious is stuff with a lot of energy. We're already primed to remember anything that catches our attention. This makes the information much easier to recall later. The fact that it initially caught your attention, coupled to the process of jotting it down in your notebook, is often enough to lock it into long-term storage. It's also worth pointing out what I'm not advising. Don't take notes in your notebook. That's not the point. The point is to establish a technical baseline and then to follow your curiosity 
true a subject, using things you find naturally interesting and thus have an easier time remembering as the structural foundation for future learning. And don't just pick any five books on the subject. There's an order to the chaos. Book 1. Start with the most popular, best-selling book you can find on the topic. Fiction, nonfiction, doesn't really matter. The goal is fun, fun, fun. This first book is less about real learning and more about gaining a little familiarity with the world you're about to enter and a basic sense of its lingo. Book 2. This is also a popular book, but usually a little more technical and a little more on point. This book is either closely related to or directly about the subject under investigation. Once again, the main goal here and the reason to choose popular books is generating excitement. Motivation-wise, you need this excitement on the front end, as it's what lays the foundation for real learning. Later on, as your knowledge base develops, the super geeky details will become really tantalizing. But when starting out, just firing up your imagination is far more important. Book 3. This is the first semi-technical book on the topic something that is still readable and interesting, but maybe not quite a page-turner. This book builds on all the ideas learned in books 1 and 2, layering in more precise language and expert-level detail. It's also where you start to get the shadowy outline of the big picture. Toward those ends, in this third book, try to find something that provides a look at that wider view, a macroscopic perspective on the subject. If you've been reading about trees, this might be the time to learn something about systems ecology. If you've been studying couples therapy, this might be when to read up on the history of social psychology. Book 4. We've Arrived. Book 4 is the first actual hard book you want to read on the subject. Something that isn't nearly as fun as the first three, but gives you a taste of the kind of problems that real experts in the domain are thinking about. Pay close attention to the field's current borders. Get a sense for when, why, and with what foundational ideas contemporary thinking about a subject begins and ends. Also, figure out where the crazy lies, the stuff that experts feel is balderdash. You may not agree with these opinions, but you need to know they exist, and more important, why they exist. Book 5 this is not always the hardest to read, that can often be book four, but it's often the hardest to comprehend. That's because the goal here is a book that is directly about the future of the topic, where it's heading, and when it's heading, a book that gives you a sense of the cutting edge. After those five books, your brain typically has enough data to give you a feel for a field. The language is familiar, and the macroscopic big picture has snapped into view. This is the point when real comprehension begins. When you can start asking meaningful, articulate questions about a subject, then you can feel confident that you've learned the basics. What does this look like in the real world? Well, consider my first novel, The Angle Quickest for Flight. The book is about five people trying to break into the Vatican to steal back one of the core Kabbalistic texts a book stolen from the Jews in the 13th century and then secreted in the secret archives. Think of it as the Da Vinci Code just a few years before there was a Da Vinci Code. To write this book, I needed to know quite a bit about Vatican history and the secret archives. So what did I read to get up to speed? Book 1. Thomas Gifford's The Assassini, a thriller about the Church's involvement in art theft during World War II. It was a fun ride that gave me a glimpse inside the Vatican. I learned some lingo and got a feeling for the world I was about to enter. Book 2. Malachi Martin's The Decline and Fall of the Roman Church Martin is a former Jesuit and Vatican history scholar and writes popular fiction and nonfiction on the subject. Again, a fairly easy read but very informative. Book 3. Karen Armstrong's a History of God. Armstrong is one of the more respected scholars in this field, and this book tells the 4,000-year story 
of the birth of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, giving me a macroscopic sense of the subject. Armstrong is also a talented writer, meaning those 4,000 years go by a lot faster than you might assume. Book 4 The Secret Archives of the Vatican by Maria Luisa Ambrosini and Mary Willis This is the core text on the subject, dense and detailed and directly on point. Book 5 Inside the Vatican by Thomas Rees Not exactly a book that peers into the future, rather one that provides an enormously wide look at the past. The book is an exhaustive, scholarly study of the world's most complex religious organization. Enough said. Two final notes. First, this is an exercise meant to help you learn subjects, not skills. If you want to learn a skill, playing piano, for example, you can't read your way to proficiency. In the next chapter, we'll explore skill acquisition. For now, we're starting with knowledge acquisition. Second, in these ADHD days, when people don't like reading, five books seems like a lot. It's definitely not. Five books is less than one would read in the first half of any course in college. And don't kid yourself when you're done. You still won't know all that much. Step 2. Be the Idiot Once you're done reading those five books, your notebook should be filled with questions. Review them. Many of those questions will now have answers. The ones that remain? That's the raw material to carry into the next step in this process. Seek out experts to talk to about those questions. Personally, as a reporter, I had an advantage in this step. It's a hell of a lot easier to call up a Nobel Prize winner on behalf of the New York Times than it is if you're trying to finish a term paper for college. But most people love to talk about what they do. So if you can't get that Nobel Prize winner on the line, text one of their graduate students. As long as you've done your homework and can ask genuine questions, most people will want to talk. In fact, most won't want to shut up. The point is to leave your pride at the door and talk to people who are way smarter than you are. In my case, I always ask people to explain things to me as if I were four years old. I want to be the idiot in that conversation. How do I know I've talked to enough experts? When the experts routinely tell the idiot he's asking good questions, then I'm sure I'm on the right track. A couple of critical details. Interviewing is a skill. You need to make your subject feel comfortable and respected. Everyone's time is valuable. Don't prattle about yourself or your investigation at the front end of that conversation. Have a list of questions prepared ahead of time. Assume you'll get no more than a half-hour interview and don't waste a second. Never ask someone something that you can look up. Make sure you've investigated talks, books, and technical papers ahead of time. Most important, Make sure your first few questions display both personal knowledge about whomever you're interviewing and general domain knowledge about their subject. Don't ask, What's your feeling on the current consciousness debate? Ask, In that paper you wrote for the Journal of Consciousness Studies, you made a neurobiological argument for panpsychism. When did you first start thinking about the problem this way? These kinds of questions are exactly how you make experts feel comfortable and respected. You're letting them know you've taken the time to investigate their work in advance and that they can speak freely in technical language and you've got the chops to keep up. Record the conversation and take copious notes along the way. Write down the stuff that catches your attention. Same rules as for reading. Use the recording to double-check facts and so you can have a copy of anything you didn't keep up with the first time through. Step 3. Explore the gaps. In our modern world, most experts tend to specialize. They end up with an incredible depth of knowledge about their chosen subject, but often with little idea about what's going on right next door. So once you've made it to the end of Step 2 and have begun asking intelligent questions, you'll start to notice blank spots in the answers. Occasionally, these spots will turn out to be central questions in the field. In other words, 
you followed your curiosity to the same place that most researchers follow their curiosity. This is great. It's proof that you're actually learning the material in question, but it's not what you're really after in this step. What you're after is what author Stephen Johnson calls a slow hunch, or the sense that the particular bit of information in the field you're now studying is related to some other bit of data in another field you've also been studying. In the beginning, these gap-driven hunches might be hard to find, and you can't really force it. But the reason you've been following your curiosity around the subject and not following, say, the standard educational curricula is to naturally seed these kinds of connections. In an interview with Reed Wright, Johnson explained it like this. It's just this idea that if you diversify and have an eclectic range of interests and you are constantly gathering interesting stories about things that you do not know that much about or are adjacent to your particular field of expertise, you are much more likely to come up with innovative ideas. The trick is to look at something different and to borrow ideas. It is like saying, this worked for this field. If we put it here, what would it do in this new context? These gaps between knowledge bases will become evident during step two of this process. As you start to figure out how to think your way around a topic, especially if you've been paying attention to its boundary lines, you'll begin to get a feel for the questions not being asked by the experts. So once you get to the point that you're asking intelligent questions, it's time to follow those questions into the gaps. This is also why we're following our curiosity around a subject. By leaning on our natural interests, we're creating the conditions needed to develop Johnson's slow hunches. But it's worth mentioning what this won't do well, help you prepare for a standard exam. If someone else is driving the learning bus, you can apply these techniques and they'll work up to a point. But because the curriculum is not your own, its goals will be different. Remember where we started, with the question of what was required before I was willing to have a public opinion about a subject. An opinion means both a firm grounding in the core ideas and some new thinking on the matter. While books formed the foundation of Step 1, here in Step 3, I prefer blogs, articles, talks, and such. Back in the Passion Recipe, we spent 10 to 20 minutes a day playing around with ideas we were curious about. Take a similar approach here. For example, say you're interested in animal behavior. Well, one category up in scale from animal behavior is ecosystem behavior. So get into that gap. Learning how whole ecosystems function can help shed light on how their independent parts work. Or you can take this another step up in scale. Animals form ecosystems, but ecosystems are simply one example of a network. What can you learn about animal behavior by studying network behavior? Get into that gap. Because of specialization, expert knowledge tends to become balkanized over time. As a result, most interesting topics are usually the ones that are stuck between categories. These are the gaps. And after you've surrounded a subject, you'll typically end up floundering around in those gaps. The floundering is what you're after. It's where slow hunches really emerge. If you suddenly find yourself with more questions than answers, well, that's how it's supposed to work. You've now managed to stumble into the true blank spots on the map. And if you've done this right, because you followed your curiosity to get into these spots, suddenly you're stuck with burning questions that no one can answer. So you'll end up trying to find those answers yourself. Out of this frustration, that's where real learning actually begins. Step 4. Always ask the next question. This advice is a throwback to the concept of truth filters. Remember the standard reporter's creed. Three sources make a fact. This means that if three people independently tell you the same thing, then you can be pretty sure that thing actually happened. But as I mentioned earlier, I discovered that something unusual occurred when I called that fifth expert. 
Typically, I got an answer that conflicted with everything else that preceded it. This is the why behind always asking the next question. It means that, at this point in the process, you want to start hunting conflicting answers. Seek out experts who disagree with the experts with whom you've already spoken. When you get to the spot where everything you thought you knew was actually wrong, then you're in the right place. And now that you're in the right place, try to solve the puzzle you've encountered. Sure, it's entirely possible that the puzzle you've stumbled upon isn't actually answerable. That's fine, too. The goal here is to have an opinion about the answer. Pick a side and be able to defend the side you've picked. Be able to say something akin to, Experts tend to disagree about this point, but my own feeling is, and then be able to explain why you feel the way you feel. Personally, I don't really think I've learned a subject until I've had this kind of revelatory butt-kicking. If my position hasn't been thoroughly reversed at least once, then I still have more work to do. Step 5. Find the Narrative Our brains are designed to link cause with effect. It's a survival mechanism. If we can backtrack the why from the what, then we can learn to predict the future. This is why the brain loves narrative, which is just cause and effect on a much larger scale. Yet, whatever the scale, the underlying biology remains the same. When we link cause and effect, it's pattern recognition. To reward this behavior, we get tiny squirts of dopamine. The pleasure of dopamine is what cements the relationship between the what and the why, essentially amplifying learning. In the late 1990s, for example, Cambridge neuroscientist Wolfram Schultz gave monkeys a squirt of juice, which is a favorite monkey reward, and watched dopamine levels spike in their brains. At the beginning of the experiment, their brains released dopamine only when they got the actual juice. In time, this dopamine spike showed up earlier, for instance, when the lab door first opened. By experiment's end, those spikes arose even earlier, when they heard footsteps in the hallway outside the laboratory's door. Essentially, what Schultz's experiment confirmed was dopamine's role in learning. Whenever we get a reward, like juice, the brain scours the recent past, hunting for what might have triggered that reward, the cause of the effect. If this pattern repeats, when we notice this cause again, we get even more dopamine. Next, we start backtracking the cause even further. Before I got juice, the lab door opened and this human arrived, and reinforcing those additional connections with even more dopamine. Now that we've reached the fifth step in our five not-so-easy steps, we want to take advantage of this exact neurobiology. The goal is to couple those initial dopamine hits from the pattern recognition that already arose from following the first four steps in this process to the even bigger rush of dopamine and, as we'll see, a host of additional neurochemicals that comes from narrative construction and social support. This is what truly cements new information into long-term storage. Thus, once again, it's time to take things public. For me, the only way I can be sure I've actually learned something is to tell it to someone else as a story. Actually, two people. The first person I tell is someone who is completely ignorant of and usually a little bored by the subject. I find family members are useful for this, but absolute strangers can work as well. If I can turn everything I've learned into a narrative compelling enough to hold this hostile audience's attention and still convey the story's critical information, then I usually feel like I'm halfway there. The second person I tell the story to is an expert. I always look for someone who's not afraid to tell me when I get things wrong. If I can satisfy both camps, then I've produced enough dopamine along the way to have cemented my knowledge. Essentially, I've learned the material. It also feels like I've really earned my way to my opinions and am comfortable having them in public. And if you've come this far, then you too should feel this way. The reason for this confidence? Neurobiology. 
By turning your own learning into the chain of cause and effect we call narrative, that is, telling it to someone as a story, you're going to find more patterns and release more dopamine. Couple this to all the neurochemistry that shows up from taking things public. More dopamine for the risk-taking, norepinephrine for the excitement, cortisol for the stress, serotonin and oxytocin from the social interaction itself, and you have an incredible tool for memory reinforcement. One final note. There are two consistent problems people encounter when using this technique. The first is to finish up those first five books and assume you know something. In martial arts, they always say that the yellow belt and the green belt, that is, advanced beginner and lower intermediate, are the most dangerous times for a student. People think they know how to fight around this point and often want to test their skills. Often, they end up getting their asses kicked. The same is true here. Five books on a subject is a great foundation, but don't mistake it for actual expertise. The second issue is equally insidious. If you followed this five-step process all the way to the end, then you probably have a huge sense of all the stuff you still don't know. Expect this. Experts often feel dumber about their subject than novices. They know what they don't know, and they know there's a lot they don't know they don't know. It's a daunting combination and one that can be crippling. Forward progress feels like backward progress, and this can be demotivating. Instead, use this to your advantage. Those additional knowledge gaps are the foundation of curiosity, so follow them into five more books and repeat the process. 11. The Skill of Skill From learning how to master new subjects to learning how to master new skills, that's the next step in this process. To help you take that step, I spent time talking to best-selling author, angel investor, and all-around life hacker extraordinaire Tim Ferriss, who, as much as anyone I know, has gone deep into the question of accelerated skill acquisition. A couple of years back, Tim took this investigation to new heights when he set out to learn 13 very difficult skills, including playing a musical instrument, driving a race car, and learning a foreign language under some very difficult conditions. Without knowing how to read music or keep time, Tim gave himself five days to see if he could learn to play drums well enough to perform on stage in front of a live audience. Stuart Copeland, the drummer for The Police, was his teacher. To make things interesting, as a final test of his skill, he convinced classic rockers Foreigner to let him drum during one of their live shows in front of a packed house. He did the same thing with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Five days to learn the martial art and a trip into a ring to fight world champions to test the results. And poker, even risking hundreds of thousands of dollars of his own money in a game with top pros as his final exam. In other words, what came to be known as the Tim Ferriss Experiment, available on iTunes, was a full-contact investigation into the outer possibilities of accelerated skills acquisition. As Tim explains, the experiment was designed to explode a bunch of bad ideas people have about adult learning. The idea that it's hard for an adult to learn a foreign language or play an instrument. The idea that developing real expertise takes years of practice. These things just aren't true. The show is about teaching people how to get superhuman results without them having to be superhuman. Tim released 13 experiments in total, and if you watch all of them, you'll start noticing some similarities among methodologies. There's overlap. Sure, on the surface, it may seem like learning how to surf and learning how to speak Tagalog, two other experiments he ran on the show, are worlds apart. Yet there are commonalities, and that's what we're after. Mastering fear, for example, is a commonality shared in almost every learning situation, which means the same calming techniques that Tim learned from surfer Laird Hamilton in an attempt to learn to surf overhead waves in a week, something it takes most novices a couple of years to figure out, were absolutely applicable 
when he was risking hundreds of thousands of dollars at the poker table. And they were also just as relevant when he was playing the drums in front of a live audience. Thus, when Tim approaches a new skill, the first thing he does is hunt for commonalities. He breaks the activity apart, deconstructing it into its individual components. He's looking for both the raw materials from which to learn and the common mistakes to avoid. Next, he hunts for overlap, or those components that show up across the board. These are the components that provide the most leverage. For example, most pop songs are constructed out of four or five chords. Mastering those chords will get you farther faster than learning any other set of musical skills. This five-chord approach to mastery is an example of the Pareto Principle, or what's sometimes called the 80-20 rule. It's the idea that 80% of your consequences stem from 20% of your actions. To apply this principle to learning, when approaching a new skill, focus your efforts on the 20% that really matter. Think the four or five chords used in every pop song. To identify these component parts, you want to survey and simplify. Start by removing the extraneous. For example, when Tim gave himself a week to master Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, instead of attempting to learn the entire martial art, he focused on only one chokehold, the guillotine choke. He then learned to use this one hold from every possible position, both attacking and defending. That chokehold was his 20% chunk, but his mastery of this one skill gave him the ability to maneuver in 80% of the situations he encountered, which is a fairly incredible return on five days' worth of effort. The larger point is that you can take more than Tim's five days to get good. Even if it takes months, this 80-20 approach to skill acquisition will absolutely save you time in the long run. But one thing to note, 80-20ing is fantastic if the skill you're trying to learn will help you go from A to B faster. When training a weakness, for example, this can be a great fit. Yet what it's not ideal for is mastering any of the skills that are core to your massively transformative purpose. For example, I would never consider 80-20ing anything that pertained to flow, as flow is core to my mission. But I've applied this idea to learning the legalese necessary to understand business contracts, because that's enough knowledge for me to have informed conversations with my lawyers. If my lawyers had 80 20 the legalese, well, that would be a problem. If the skill or information you're learning is at the dead center of your massively transformative purpose, then your real goal has to be total mastery, and that requires more learning than Pareto's principle can offer. If you're wondering why, return to Gary Klein's list of the things experts know that others don't. That said, consistently focusing your learning on the 20% of information that will make 80% of the difference, and doing this over and over again, will absolutely shorten the path to mastery. Tim has argued that this approach can get you to real expertise in about a year and a half of dedicated work, or about eight and a half years faster than those purported 10,000 hours. Now, to be sure, Tim's experiment got ugly. He fell down. He broke bones, especially when trying to master parkour in a week. But that's actually the point. Look, he says, I wasn't a great learner. I sucked at foreign languages as a kid. I didn't learn to swim until I was 30. This is exactly why I know this stuff works. If I can do it, anyone can do it. 12 stronger. Up to now, we've been exploring the skills and meta-skills that surround learning. Here, we want to switch focus and discuss exactly what you want to be learning. There are three categories to explore. First, the obvious. If you're chasing high, hard goals, then learn whatever you need to learn to chase those goals. Second, the unpleasant. A few chapters ago, we talked about developing the grit to train our weaknesses. One way or another, developing that grit requires adding new skills or new knowledge to your repertoire. So that's also what you want to learn. Finally, 
we want to turn our attention to the exact opposite side of this coin, to our core strengths. Learning to identify our core strengths, literally identifying those things we're best at, then learning how to get even better at them, is fundamental to peak performance. From the 1940s onward, psychologists from Carl Rogers and Carl Jung to Martin Seligman and Christopher Peterson have argued that using our core strengths on a regular basis is one of the best ways to increase happiness, well-being, and the amount of flow in our lives. In fact, Seligman has argued that the best way to increase flow is to spend as much time as possible on activities that utilize one or more of our five top strengths. At a psychological level, working with our strengths, that is, getting better at what we're already good at, increases feelings of autonomy and mastery, two of our more potent intrinsic drivers. In turn, these drivers amp up confidence, focus, and engagement, which all combine to increase learning and foster flow. Finally, since flow further amplifies learning, this strengthens our strengths and starts the cycle over again. Neurobiologically, strengths appear to have a number of different functions. Most important is dopamine. We like being good at things, and this produces dopamine, which tightens focus, increases motivation, and helps us get even better at what we're already good at. Many researchers also believe that our strengths play a role in sensory gating, which is what helps the brain decide which bits of information make it up to the conscious mind for processing and which get weeded out as irrelevant. We like being good at things, and we like getting better at things. So anything that can aid that cause gets tagged as important and is passed along for conscious processing. Yet because the idea of training our strengths is still new to psychology, there are open questions about the complete list of strengths to train. Seligman and Peterson, in a recent book on the subject, list 24 core strengths, while Gallup organization's Clifton Strengths raises that to 34, and the Strengths Profiler has 60 different potential strengths, weaknesses, and learned behaviors. So whose diagnostic should you trust? Your own is my answer. Sure, if you want to take Seligman and Peterson's ideas for a spin, their website, www.viacharacter.org, provides a free 240-question diagnostic. The results are confidential and get sent right to your inbox. You can also find Clifton Strengths and the Strengths Profiler and a host of other assessments online. But an easier way to solve this puzzle is by trusting your own history. Start with your five biggest wins, that is, those five achievements that you are proudest of and produce the largest positive impact in your life. Then break each of these down, looking for all the key strengths that helped you achieve this victory. What matters most is specificity. Don't just add persistence to your list. Add the specific type of persistence. If your victory was aided by a willingness to repeatedly go back to the library and gather as much information as possible about a subject, then intellectual rigor is a much more useful identifier than persistence. Now that you have this list, it's time to hunt for intersections. At the beginning of this book, we identified places where our core passions intersected our core purposes, then used this information to derive massively transformative purposes, big goals, and clear goals. Here, we want to further this process by finding places where our strengths align with our motivational stack. Say your MTP is to end world hunger. One of your high, hard goals is to advance the field of vertical farming. Then, in the list of clear goals you create on a daily basis, lean on your strengths. If you're strong in people skills like teamwork, social intelligence, and leadership, well, community activism is going to be a better fit than a quiet life in a research lab. Once you've identified a core strength that serves your MTP, Seligman recommends you try to use that strength once a week, in a new way and in an environment that matters, with family, for example, or at work. Spend two to three months training up one strength, that is, 
trying it out in a new way in a new situation at least once a week, before moving on to another. Over the course of a year, you'll find places where multiple strengths directly intersect with your MTP. That's the real goal. If you can work toward your life's purpose by utilizing core strengths, you'll end up significantly increasing the amount of flow in your life. Once again, you'll go farther, faster. And this answers our question, what should I learn? Learn to sharpen your sword. Learn to use your strengths to advance your cause. If what we're learning completely aligns with who we are, we speed the plow. The work gets done faster, and you'll reap a more bountiful harvest in the end. 13. The 80-20 of Emotional Intelligence At the center of this book is the question of extreme innovation. What does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take to do what's never been done? Or with less hyperbole, what does it take to sustain high levels of peak performance long enough to accomplish a series of high, hard goals? One answer comes from University of Michigan psychologist Chris Peterson, who believes you can sum up most of the lessons of positive psychology in a single phrase. Other people matter. Peterson is talking about the fact that if you're interested in happiness, well-being, and overall life satisfaction, you need other people in the equation. Social support, love, empathy, caring, connection, and so on, is foundational to mental health. Other people matter. It sounds like a bumper sticker, explained Peterson in an article for Psychology Today, but it is actually a good summary of what positive psychology research has shown about the good life broadly construed. And this is especially true if you're interested in impossible. Whenever we encounter a difficult situation, the brain makes a basic risk assessment based on the quality and quantity of our close relationships. If you have friends and family around to help you attack a problem, your potential for actually solving that problem increases significantly. The brain treats the situation as an interesting challenge, not a dangerous threat. The result is dopamine. The brain gives you a squirt of the good stuff to prepare you to rise to that challenge. But if you have to face that situation alone, without emotional support or outside assistance, your likelihood of success decreases and your anxiety levels increase. Instead of dopamine, you get stress chemicals like cortisol. Since these chemicals can crush performance, if you're interested in the impossible, the basic biology of your nervous system demands that you take other people along for the ride. Equally important, between you and your dreams, other people lie. Sometimes these people are obstacles, sometimes they're opportunities, but in either case, very few people manage to accomplish the impossible on their own. For these reasons alone, your list of peak performance skills has to include interpersonal skills, such as communication, collaboration, cooperation, and the like. Of course, this sounds self-serving, but the point remains, if impossible is your goal, then developing deep emotional intelligence is crucial to your chances of success. Emotional intelligence, or EQ for short, is a catch-all used to describe our ability to accurately perceive, express, appraise, understand, and regulate emotions in ourselves and others. In psychological terms, it's personal skills like motivation, self-awareness, and self-control, as well as interpersonal skills such as care, concern, and empathy. In neurobiological terms, EQ takes some explaining. The first thing to know is that until very recently, we knew very little. The long shadow of B.F. Skinner and behaviorism claimed that emotions were not a topic for serious scientists. Too squishy. Too subjective. But in the 1990s, brain imaging technology improved to the point that scientists could begin to map the neuron-by-neuron -neuron pathways of our basic emotions. This work ended a half-century's worth of controversy 
and led to the discovery of the seven aforementioned emotional systems present in all animals, including humans. And systems is the operative word. Emotions don't come from any single location in the brain. Instead, they're generated by those seven core networks. Fear, lust, care, play, rage, seeking, and panic-slash-grief. Each of these networks is a specific electrochemical pathway through the brain that produces specific feelings and behaviors. Thus, emotional intelligence, from a neurobiological perspective, can be thought of as the cognitive capacities needed to effectively manage each of these seven networks. There's also a growing consensus about the parts of the brain required to do just that. While the list is far from complete, the structures involved include a cluster of deeper brain regions, thalamus, hypothalamus, basal ganglia, amygdala, hippocampus, and anterior cingulate cortex, and a trio of areas in the prefrontal cortex, the dorsolateral, ventromedial, and orbitofrontal prefrontal cortex. In a very real sense, training EQ involves learning to recognize the signals sent by these regions and learning to act on them or not act on them accordingly. And there are very good reasons for learning these skills. In decades of studies in dozens of domains, EQ remains one of the highest indicators of high achievement. High EQ correlates to everything from good moods to good relationships to really good chances of success. As journalist Nancy Gibbs once quipped in Time magazine, IQ gets you hired, but EQ gets you promoted. And this brings us to the next thing we need to learn in the learning section. How to supercharge emotional intelligence. To do this, it helps to start with the basics. Researchers break EQ into four areas, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. The first two categories, self-awareness and self-management, involve our relationship with ourselves. Self-awareness is usually defined as knowledge of one's own feelings, motives, desires, and character, while self-management involves taking responsibility for one's own behavior and well-being. The latter two categories, social awareness and relationship management, involve our relations with others. Social awareness requires the ability to comprehend both the interpersonal struggles of another and the broader problems of society, for example, awareness of racism and misogyny. Finally, relationship management is all about your interpersonal communication skills. Many of the skills found in Part 1 are what's required to train up these categories. For example, the mindfulness exercises covered in the GRIT section are among the very best ways to stretch the gap between thought and emotion, giving you awareness of the first and control over the second. The passion recipe and the goal-setting exercises to offer a second example enhance motivation, a self-management skill, and expand self-awareness. More important, most self-awareness slash self-management tactics share one essential commonality, autopilot awareness. As William James pointed out, humans are habit machines. He called habit the great flywheel of society, and more recent research backs up this claim. We now know that somewhere between 40% and 80% of what we do is done automatically, mostly unconsciously, out of habit. This is the exact strategy the brain uses to conserve energy, but, especially if we've got the wrong habits, it can wreak havoc on our lives. Thus, you can take a page out of Tim Ferriss's book and 80-20 an approach to emotional intelligence by developing autopilot awareness. If you can start to notice your knee-jerk reactions, you can start to make choices. Is this a good knee-jerk reaction or a bad one? A helpful habit or a disaster waiting to happen? If we notice our patterns, we can break those patterns and create better ones. In fact, a great many of the brain structures involved in emotional intelligence are structures in the prefrontal cortex 
that help us overwrite our automatic behavior. That's autopilot awareness, and, at least on paper, it's not all that hard to train. One easy way to begin is to pause for a breath before you speak, act, or react, especially in situations of high emotion. In that pause, get clear on your motives. Ask yourself why you're about to do what you're about to do. Then evaluate your response. Be accountable for your flaws. Monitor and overwrite negative self-talk and widen your emotional vocabulary. Don't sleep on this last item. Being able to describe what you're feeling in increasing detail and with more precise language expands your feelings landscape. The limits of my language, as Ludwig Wittgenstein reminds us, are the limits of my world. We can also take an 80-20 approach to the equally crucial second half of the emotional intelligence equation, social awareness and relationship management. To do this, we're going to focus on the two skills researchers emphasize most consistently for these categories, active listening and empathy. Active listening is the art of engaged presence. It's listening with genuine curiosity, but without judgment or attachment to outcome. No daydreaming. No thinking about whatever smart thing you're going to say next. Patience is key. Genuine relating means listening until the other is done and asking only clarifying questions along the way. A lot of experts recommend summarizing what's been said aloud, which both enhances communication and tightens social bonds, ensuring that both parties feel seen and heard. Active listening also lines up with other performance tactics we've been employing. It automatically activates curiosity releasing a little dopamine and norepinephrine into our system. These chemicals heighten attention, prime learning, and give us the best chance of using what we're hearing to find connections with older ideas, thus creating conditions for pattern recognition and more dopamine release. The result of all these neurochemicals in our system is a much greater chance of getting into flow, which is why University of North Carolina psychologist Keith Sawyer identified active listening as a flow trigger and a topic to which we'll return. For now, let's turn to the next skill, empathy. The ability to share and understand the feelings of another is one of the fastest paths toward emotional intelligence. Learning to develop empathy promotes both self-awareness and social awareness, deepening our ability to understand ourselves and to understand our impact on others. This leads to greater efficacy on the individual side and better communication and collaboration on the social side. In recent years, scientists have made serious inroads into understanding empathy, including coming to realize that it's an easily trainable skill. For a variety of not completely understood reasons, motor resonance leads to emotional resonance, which means that when we see someone else perform an action, or experience a sensation. The same parts of our brains light up as if we ourselves were actually performing that same action or experiencing that same sensation. It happens automatically. And we can take advantage of this biological fact to train up empathy. To do that, researchers have identified two key strategies, imagination and meditation. Imagination means putting the cliché into action, literally asking yourself how it would feel to walk a mile in the other person's shoes. Start with the obvious question. Ask yourself, if this were happening to me, how would I feel? Be exploratory in your approach. Consider the situation from multiple angles so you can come to understand the full range of emotional possibilities that the situation might produce. Additionally, Really feel the resulting emotions. Locate the somatic address of those feelings, noting where in your body the sensations occur. Notice the quality and depth of the emotions. Do they manifest as a tingle or an ache? Are they twitchy or solid? Most crucially, notice how emotions can color perception. The second strategy for empathy expansion is 
Compassion Enhancing Meditation In research conducted by Harvard psychologist Daniel Goleman and University of Wisconsin psychologist Richard Davidson, seven hours of compassion enhancing meditation produced a noticeable uptick in empathy and permanent changes in the brains of practitioners. After seven hours, there was stronger activity in the insula, a part of the brain that helps us detect emotion, and in the temporal parietal junction, a part of the brain that lets us see things from alternative perspectives and helps generate empathy. To try out compassion-enhancing meditation for yourself, simply find a quiet spot, sit down, and close your eyes. Bring to mind someone who has been kind to you and toward whom you feel gratitude. Silently wish them well and wish for their safety, happiness, health, and well-being. Next, do the same for other people you love, mainly friends and family members. Work outward. Co-workers, acquaintances, strangers, the man who works at the dry cleaners, the woman who repairs your computer. Finally, bestow those same wishes upon yourself. The research shows that 20 minutes a day for two weeks will seriously move the empathy needle. And pay close attention to the results. One of the inherent difficulties with mindfulness practices, including this compassion exercise, is the sizable gap between cause and effect. We sit still 20 minutes today, and five days later, we're nicer to our mother on the phone. But look for that increase in niceness and keep a running tally of results. Being able to trust that the practice is working is critical for sustaining motivation. And when it comes to the work, don't use a compassion-enhancing meditation by itself. Combining imagination and meditation produces the best results. When we put ourselves in another's shoes, especially if that person is in a particularly distressing situation, the brain does something sneaky. Because we don't enjoy suffering, even if the suffering isn't our own, the brain eases our pain by tuning out the other person. As Daniel Goleman explained in an article for Fast Company, this is a recipe for indifference rather than kindness. But there's a handy solution. Scientists at the Max Planck Institutes found that combining empathy imagination exercises with a compassion-enhancing meditation actually changes the neuronal circuits activated by another's suffering. Instead of tuning out the other's pain, the circuits that light up are the same ones that are activated when a mother responds to her child's distress. This not only overrides the brain's built-in shutdown valve, it actually builds empathy even faster. And when we combine active listening with deeper empathy, we get the feel-good neurochemistry that comes from positive social interaction. Dopamine, endorphins, oxytocin, and serotonin. That's a lot of feel-good. This is why EQ is such a consistent indicator of high achievement. It means that both our actions and our emotions are fueling our quest for impossible. 14. The Shortest Path to Superman It wouldn't be a chapter on learning if we didn't explore psychologist Anders Ericsson's so-called 10,000-hour rule. When it comes to peak performance, the rule suggests, talent is a myth. Training is the key. And not just any kind of training. To achieve mastery in a given field, Erickson's research showed that 10,000 hours of deliberate practice is required. Practice is deliberate because it meets three conditions. The learner receives explicit instructions about the very best method has access to immediate feedback and performance results, and can repeat the same or very similar tasks. In short, Erickson's results argue for early specialization and extreme repetition. These results have produced results. They were canonized in The Cambridge Handbook of Expertise and Expert Performance and popularized by writers like Malcolm Gladwell. They also spawned an industry of specialization advocates, tiger moms, helicopter parenting, take your pick. Yet there's a rub. 
early specialization hasn't produced anything close to the expertise it was designed to create. Quite often, with younger children, this approach has them quitting the very activity they were once trying to master. With adults, the impact is equally damaging. In older learners, extreme specialization tends to make people narrow-minded and overconfident, essentially blind to most of the facts and too dependent on the few facts they do know. And this brings us to the three major challenges to the 10,000-hour rule. The first challenge was mounted by Erickson himself. When Malcolm Gladwell published Outliers, which was the book that made this idea into an industry, Erickson pointed out that, while he had studied expertise in very specific areas, the 10,000 hours initially came from a study of violinists, and his findings have been duplicated in other domains, golf, for example, they definitely did not apply in every field. Furthermore, those 10,000 hours were an average tally of an arbitrary marker. Gladwell chose 10,000 hours because that was the average time a 20-year-old top-tier violinist had practiced. If he had made the cutoff 18 years old or 22 years old, the results would have been a very different number. In short, most people take much longer than 10,000 hours to achieve mastery. Occasionally, in certain fields, certain people can get there much more quickly. But using it as a hard and fast metric for expertise, Erickson feels, isn't justified by his findings. The second major challenge came from my book, The Rise of Superman, which examined the unprecedented progress made by action and adventure sports athletes over the past three decades. During this period, these athletes accomplished more impossible feats than almost any other group of people in history. Now the puzzling part. The athletes achieved these death-defying results by not following the 10,000-hour rule, or for that matter, any of the rules normally associated with peak performance. Over the past 50 years, when scientists turned their attention to excellence and achievement, three factors have played an outsized role. Mothers, musicians, and marshmallows. Essentially, these are the three traditional paths to mastery. Mothers reflect the nature and nurture side of this equation, the indisputable fact that both genetics and early childhood environment are crucial for learning and success. Musicians is a callback to the violinists Anders Ericsson studied in order to come up with his idea of deliberate practice. Finally, marshmallows is a reference to Stanford psychologist Walter Michel's fabled experiment in delayed gratification. Michel found that children who could resist temptation in the present moment, that is, eating a marshmallow now, for the promise of a bigger reward, eating two marshmallows later, were far more successful in life. And this is true on a half-dozen different measures. More than grades, IQ scores, SAT scores, or just about anything else, the ability to delay gratification seems to be a consistent indicator of future achievement. Yet, despite these findings, very few of the athletes in RISE had any of these advantages. Broken homes and bad childhoods were more the rule than the exception, meaning that neither nature nor nurture was on the job. As far as 10,000 hours of deliberate practice goes, there wasn't a whole lot of that either. Sure, these athletes spent a considerable amount of time working on their craft, but almost none of that was spent on rote repetition. Most of the time, these athletes performed in living environments, the mountains, the oceans, where the terrain changes on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, making, in many cases, the necessary repetition of deliberate practice not even possible. Plus, many of the athletes involved had abandoned professional sports careers because they hated doing the repetitive drills that underpin deliberate practice. In fact, the very terms they coined to describe themselves, free skiers, free surfers, free riders, were an expression of this rejection. Finally, the question of delayed gratification was almost ridiculous. Action sports are all about instant gratification. These athletes are hedonistic devotees of 
chasing the stoke, and an entire dictionary of similar terms. There are folks who absolutely would have eaten Michelle's marshmallow. Yet, somehow, despite not following any of the traditional rules for excellence, they still managed to rewrite the rule book on human possibility. The third and final challenge to the 10,000-hour rule was mounted by author David Epstein in his fantastic book, Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. Essentially, range is a well-constructed argument against the cult of specialization. In Epstein's research, when he studied peak performers, rather than a decade of deliberate practice in a single domain, he found the opposite. Instead of picking one subject and sticking to it, the data shows that most top performers start their careers with a wide sampling period. This is an age of discovery, where they're testing out all kinds of new activities, bouncing from this to that and back again, and often without much rhyme or reason. So forget about early specialization and 10,000 hours to mastery. What Epstein's research showed was that the fastest way to the top was to zigzag. So what's going on? Is 10,000 hours the rule or the exception? Do we actually need these decades of deliberate practice? Or might there be an easier way or a shorter path? The answer is yes and no, and a whole lot more. Match quality. It helps to start with Epstein's discovery, the zigzag path to peak performance. Why is the fastest route the most circuitous? It comes down to match quality, which is the term economists use to describe a very tight fit among skills, interests, and the work that you do. When Shane McConkie says, I love what I do, that's an expression of match quality. Peak performers, the research shows, tend to start out their careers with a wide sampling period because they're hunting for that perfect match fit. From the outside, this period looks like the exact opposite of early specialization. Mostly, it appears to be dilly-dallying. Wow, dinosaurs are the coolest thing in the universe. Wow, comic books are better than dinosaurs. Double wow, tennis is even better than comic books. But once peak performers get that fit right, that is, learn to love what they do, the result is a serious turbo boost. In dozens of studies, match quality is directly correlated with higher learning rates, which makes it one of the better predictors of sustained peak performance. Or as Epstein says, when you get fit, it looks like grit. And the combination of accelerated learning and enhanced grit works like compound interest, which is also why, as a predictor of long-term success, match fit turns out to be a far better indicator than early specialization. In education, for example, early specialization programs such as Head Start produce a significant fade-out effect, where the kids grow bored and end up quitting the activity altogether, giving them a head start to exactly nowhere. In business, we see something similar and then some. Income-wise, while early specializers get out to an early lead, it doesn't last. After about six years in the workforce, those who began their careers with wider sampling periods tend to catch those early specializers, then leave them in the dust. And because they lack match quality, early career specializers tend to burn out and change fields. In fact, if your interest is the executive branch, rather than specialized training in a single job, the number of different jobs done in a given field remains one of the best predictors of CEO success. And it's for all these reasons that match quality has been baked into this book. The passion exercise is simply a long sampling period that emphasizes learning through doing. And if your interest is match quality, the doing is key. Trial and error are the fast track to self-knowledge. We learn what we like and what we're good at through hands-on experimentation. The research consistently shows that we cannot predict our likes or our strengths in advance. Act first, think second, is what the science says. 
This is also why, in the last section, to identify our strengths, we trusted our history rather than leaning on any of the leading diagnostics. Life, it seems, is best revealed in the living. From a big-picture perspective, match quality is a sign that our five foundational intrinsic motivators — curiosity, passion, purpose, mastery, autonomy — are properly stacked. Aligned motivators significantly heighten attention, which is always the foundation of learning. It comes down to energy. When we attend, we're making a choice about how to spend our energy. We're shifting limited neuronal resources toward a single source, filtering out the world in service of a question. Attention is an inquiry. Are you important? If that answer is yes, if the thing you're paying attention to is worth the energy, the automatic result is learning. This is how the system works, and with match quality, we're getting the system to work for us. More flow. If you really want to understand how those early action sports athletes achieved more impossible feats than almost any other group of people in history, while that answer might start with match quality, it most definitely ends with flow. And the reason should already be familiar. Neurochemistry. If you want to accelerate progress down the path to mastery, you need to learn to amplify learning and memory. A quick shorthand for how these processes work in the brain. The more neurochemicals that show up during an experience, the better chance that experience moves from short-term holding into long-term storage. That's another job performed by neurochemicals. They tag experiences as important, save for later. In flow, four or five or maybe six of the most potent neurochemicals the brain can produce flood into our system. That's a lot of important save for later. The result is a significant spike in learning and memory. In experiments run by researchers at Advanced Brain Monitoring in conjunction with the U.S. Department of Defense, novice marksmen and women were shifted into flow, then trained up to the expert level. They did this with handgun shooters, rifle shooters, and archers. In each case, it took 50% less time than normal for students to become experts. So those fabled 10,000 hours to mastery? What the research shows is that flow can cut that in half. This explains how the action and adventure sports athletes in Rise pushed the limits of human performance so fast and so far. They did what they loved to do, a perfect match fit, and they did it in a way that generated a ton of flow. The state and its impact on learning was what allowed these athletes to shortcut the path to mastery. It's a virtuous cycle, and yet another reason why the road to impossible is shorter than many believe. When flow is reward, learning shifts from something done consciously, with energy and effort, to something done automatically, out of habit and joy. It's the habit of ferocity applied to learning. If we can automate this whole instinct, from the first spark of curiosity that ignites the adventure through the rush of mastery that is its never-ending conclusion, then we're constantly feeding our passion and purpose. This is what allows us to play the infinite game. If you keep learning, you keep playing. And if you keep playing for years on end, one day you might notice that the stakes involved not only exceed your expectations, they exceed your imagination, which is, after all, one reason they call it the infinite game. Part 3. Creativity. I don't do drugs. I am drugs. Salvador Dali. 15. The Creative Advantage. If your interest is high achievement, creativity matters. That's the place to start. Back in 2002, the Partnership for 21st Century Learning, a nonprofit educational coalition that included everyone from executive.